Welcome everybody to ADA Advocacy in the post-ADA world and why we still need it. Um, as I said, my name is Anne Deschamps. I'm the director of the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. And um, I just want to give a little welcome to um, Misty, Dion, Karen Cook, and Jay Harder from uh, the, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves, um, for Center for Independent Living, um, the Roads to Freedom Center for Independent Living. Um, I am so excited to host this webinar today because it's a compelling story of a odyssey. I don't know how else to describe it. And you can decide after you hear this story, a multi-year odyssey to implement the Americans with Disabilities Act in the city of Williamsport. And something you would think as simple as making a town hall accessible to people with disabilities turns out not to be so simple. Um, one of the reasons that I felt so strongly about bringing you this story was because if you listen to the whole story, you will find something in this for everybody, a lesson in this for everybody. And I ask you to uh, listen specifically for all the different nuances of advocacy, because you'll learn that, self, that advocacy isn't black or white. There's a lot of, of, of places on the continuum where advocacy falls. So without any further uh, intro on my part, I would like to turn it over, I assume, to Missy. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Anne. Um, like Anne said, my name is Misty Dion. I'm the CEO for Roads to Freedom Center for Independent Living. I am a uh, young woman, long, dark hair, fair skinned with glasses on sitting at my desk. Um, and I am joined by my colleagues and I'll turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Uh, Jay. Good afternoon, my name is Jay Harner. I am the supervisor of short-term services and supports here at Rose the Freedom Center for Independent Living. I am a 42 year old white male. I have a white shirt white hooded sweatshirt, and I have short brown hair. And my name is Karen Koch. I serve as the advocacy coordinator at the Roads to Freedom Center for Independent Living. I am a white woman with white hair and a full figure and seated at my office in Williamsport. Uh, my colleagues and I have introduced, we are with Roads to Freedom Center for Independent Living in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and I've had the opportunity to work alongside Mid-Atlantic ADA Center for many years. Um, and in doing so, um, you know, we provided presentations and trainings on accessibility, um, restaurants, hospitality, and many other and then North Central PA ADAPT was actually started in 2017 by our group, a smaller group, uh, Shaylin Suzalis, Jerry Webb, Tima Cummings. Um, I'm gonna forget all of the founders, but there was a strong group and we sort of came together in July of 2017. And, and these two, both Roads to Freedom and North Central PA ADAPT um, will later be known as the organizational plaintiffs in the case for our um, fight for access in Williamsport. In addition to the two organizational plaintiffs, we had four organizational plaintiffs, which were members of the community, um, Citizens with Disabilities. Jay is one of them. Um, and he can talk more from his, pers his perspective, uh, perceptive, perception, sorry. Um, but the, the video or the picture you see on the screen today um, is a group of North Central PA ADAPT members outside of a building advocating um, and protesting for against the rollback for Medicaid in summer of 2017. And it was at this meeting actually that the mayor of Williamsport um, took our invite, stopped over, learned a little bit about what North Central PA ADAPT is about. And um, during that time sort of invited us into future planning on accessibility needs for the city. 
Ah, the lovely Williamsport City Hall. Um, this slide shows the, the photo of the building. Um, Williamsport City Hall is a historical building. It was constructed, the construction began in 1888 and it was completed in 1891. It was initially built to serve as the post office in the city of Williamsport. Um, folks may be familiar with Williamsport, often associated with Little League Baseball. Um, there was a time in the early 1900s when per capita Williamsport had one of the greatest percentages of millionaires across the country, all based on the lumber industry. So it was in 1979 that the city of Williamsport moved into City Hall and occupied the building um, that we will be speaking quite a bit about today. This is a three-story building with a fourth-story limited access. It is a huge gray building and all of the public entrances, all of the entrances to this building require a person be able to ambulate steps. The only entrance that had any kind of access was through the police department. All right, so as Karen said, uh, access to the building for somebody disabled and using a mobility, mobility device has to go through the uh, police department. So as this picture shows you, this is a street level view of uh, the access to enter the back of the building where the ramp is. So uh, the first, so the picture shows the park, a parking lot with several cars with a, with a steep incline going to the top of the very parking lot. Um, for reference, for the steepness, if you take a look at that motorcycle to the left, that angle or that car to the right that's kind of cut off, you can see how the slope is. So if you can imagine yourself using a manual wheelchair or a set of crutches, or some type of device that's not even, even a uh, power wheelchair. This incline, this picture does not even do it justice. I am a quadriplegic. I am paralyzed in the mid chest down. I use a Permobile F5 chair. And I can tell you going up this hill, even fully charged, my chair, it takes some oomph to get going. It's, it's quite steep. As you can see, there's no lighting. Um, and as, as you can see, as you also see as you go up here, there's very little access to parking. So. Uh, for somebody to access the entrance where we go up here, it's not, not only is it, it's very dangerous, but it's, it's not, it's not suitable for any type of entering or exiting a vehicle um, for anybody. So here we are, here is the bottom of the ramp for entering City Hall. So a couple of things about this. So I don't mean to laugh. It's just, it's funny to me. Um, at the bottom of this ramp right here. So if you see that there's, there's a, a slight in the left hand corner of that picture, there's a slight darker part, uh, part of a like black top. That is the edge of the, dis the handicap accessible parking space. So if anybody is going to park and access the ramp, they park directly in front of the ramp. Now, personally, I faced many barriers. I've never faced a, a parking spot so close to the ramp where I have tried to access City Hall several times where I've not been able to because somebody has pulled their car directly to the edge of the ramp where you cannot cross in front of the car or vehicle to access the ramp. Um, second thing is, if you look at the handicap accessible or access sign, it's mobile. So that sign is not always sitting there. That can be picked up, it can be moved, it can be thrown, it can be put out of sight, out of mind. So there's lots of times where somebody will pull up and park there and not even know that it's a handicap accessible parking spot. Um, also, there are no uh, blue lines for a ramp, for a van, for any type of accessible vehicle for somebody to use a chair or a device to exit. Um, I, again, I personally, I'm a, I'm a quadriplegic. I have a brawn mobility van, that minivan that has a fold out accordion ramp that comes out the passenger side when the door opens. Uh, Honest, this is the honest truth. If you look at the if you look at the picture in front of the accessible sign, there's some spouting. I went to exit a my van one evening, and the mayor of Williamsport almost ran my ramp over as I was folding it out because there's no lighting, and there's no blue lines in the parking spot to safely fold out a ramp. So that's just that's part of the problem right there with the parking lot. Um, again, there's just no. There's no safe way, there's no designated area, and there's a lack of enforcement and a lack of oversight when it comes to using that spot legally and illegally when it comes to 
uh, citizens of Williamsport and employees of City Hall. Next slide, please. I think that's slide 16, Jay, the next one. 16. Yes, yes. So if you are able to make it to the top of the ramp, this is the entrance that you see. This is the police entrance into the building. So as you can see the sign there, there's, there's double doors and the sign says, uh, if police department is closed, please call 570-329-4066 for assistance. So if you look at the picture, uh, there's the two doors directly below the notice sign. You can see there's, there's a, there's a on, the, on the side of the wall, there's several buttons there. So for somebody to come into the building that's using, you know, that's trying to enter the accessible area, you have to first, you have, you have to ring the buzzer and the, po the police will answer and ask you what you're there for and what you're doing. So you have to state, you know, I, I'm disabled, I'm using this entrance to enter the building and they'll, they'll hit a button for you to come in. Now, if nobody's there, you're gonna sit and you're gonna wait. Two minutes, five minutes, I've waited half an hour. And that's during, during business hours. So uh, it's, it's a major barrier that if you're disabled, you cannot access the building safely to enter it on your own and on your own time. Next slide, please. Now, if you're able to enter the building, you go into the police area and this is the next door you have to, you have to encounter. If you look at the single door, uh, steel door, very heavy. Uh, myself, I cannot open that door uh, due, due to my lack of mobility and my lack of strength. If you look to the left of the door on the wall, there's a black looking little keypad. The police and city personnel have a swipe key that they can put to those, those uh, buzzer areas, I guess you'd say, that will allow that door to open. Without that key, you cannot access that door if it is shut, because when that door is shut, it is locked. Mm -hmm. So you can actually enter the building sometimes, but be locked in that area. So again, the lack of access is very, very uh, unsafe, unfair, and it's pretty distinguishable when you can't enter the building. Do you want to go to the next slide, Karen? Sure. Thank you, Jay. Um, slide 18 is, excuse me, slide um, 18 yep. shows, um, like Jay was talking about, you know, if you've been able to navigate the labyrinth and you're in the building and now you're getting closer to actually entering City Hall. But once you get into the secure area, which is the home for the Williamsport Police Department, um, you must pass the bench. Now, if this image is a large wooden and concrete bench and mounted on the end of the bench dangling by one cuff is a set of steel handcuffs. This is where individuals that are coming in and being charged with crimes are handcuffed. So you have to pass that group of folks to make your way. And hopefully, you know, if if. If, if all is good and there's people there to answer the door and there's someone in the office, you, you may get this far in under five or 10 minutes. Next slide, please. Sharon, if I can interject real quick. Absolutely, so, Jay. So to give everybody just a quick, so just a little personal experience that Karen and I had. Uh, about, I don't know, it's probably about a year and a half ago, her and I went over to City Hall to go talk to the clerk. And we were, we were actually able to enter the building pretty uneventful, not that the way very long. Um, Karen came in the, the handicap entrance with me. Uh, we went to leave the building. The, the, the door that I was talking about, the buzzer being on the side of the door, went to leave the building, the door was locked. Um, if anybody knows Karen, Karen's very outspoken. She's very demonstrative and she needs to be. Karen banged on that door for approximately 20 to 25 minutes. And when I say banged, I mean, she let it be known that we were trying to exit the building. Um, it took 20, I'd say 25 minutes, Karen. About that there, is very accurate, Jay. For a police officer to come to the door, crack the door open and put his head through it and very abruptly wanted to know what the problem was and why we were making so much noise. When we explained I was trying to exit the building, how unsafe it was, uh, they were not very, not very appreciative or, or very, or very uh, cooperative due to Karen's actions. But we said, hey, you know, I, I need to leave the building. I'm, I have things to do. If this was an emergency, what would we have done? And, you know, with, with a blank stare and a no answer, he just opened the door and said, here, you're, you're, you're free to go. And when he said free to go, I felt like I was, a, not only was I a prisoner, I'm a prisoner of my own body due to my disability sometimes, 
I was a prisoner in the building because I couldn't access to leave. And I said to him, I said, you know, again, I'm, I'm paralyzed. So I need to do certain things different. And I said, what if I needed to use the restroom and my items were in the, my car and I was having a medical emergency and he just kept walking. He wouldn't answer any questions. He didn't want to hear anything about it. And I was just trying to educate him on how, how unfair and, you know, how it's basically illegal to keep somebody in a building when they want to leave, when they fully want to go. So that, that's just a little bit of the experience we have with the city of police in the, in, the, in the city of Williamsburg when it comes to access to the building. Yeah, Jay, I think you hit it right on the head. Um, the, the police officer that responded, we, I, you know, Jay and I had discussed that if someone didn't respond within a half hour, we would call 911 and call the police and ask the police to help us get out of their building. But yeah, the officer was very annoyed. It was as if Jay and I being in that building and, and the police officer having to leave his desk and come down the hallway to open the door. Um, yeah, his body language, facial expressing expression, everything said annoyed. You know, we were an inconvenience to him. Um, the slide on the screen now, I, I have a little collection of the accessible parking spot at City Hall. Now, as Jay spoke, it's not truly accessible, but you have on, on this slide um, two separate images. They may look the same, but they were taken at different times of the City of Williams Sports police cruisers. Now, I will add that these cruisers are not operated by a person with a disability, but the police department essentially using the accessible parking for their own convenience. Um, if we had three days to do this PowerPoint, I could have included um, quite a few other photos we have photos of the maintenance crew using this, the transportation crew. You know, it's just a matter of first come, first serve. Whoever gets there can have the accessible parking. Next slide, please. Okay, sorry about that. Folks got lost in my notes here. Um, I'm, I'll do a quick little history. When I started working at Roads to Freedom Center for Independent Living, Misty, um, the very first thing Misty said to me was one of her priorities after working with ADAPT and other individuals in the community was access in Williamsport and at City Hall specifically. So I began my job in February of 2018 working with the SIL and I began attending the bi-weekly meetings of Public Works, um, city council, all kinds of different meetings to, to get in there. And one of the first times I, I met with representatives and I asked them about their 504 plan, they did not know what it was. They were not familiar with it. And so I said, well, maybe you have it as a transition plan. So talk to the city and explain, you know, you guys are really behind times. Um, at this point, you know, we've, the ADA has been in effect for 28 years. And I was absolutely thrilled where... Two months after I'd started my position, um, the, the image on the screen here, the slide shows the city codes department, individuals seated in manual wheelchairs, individuals at a table. And we are looking at the architect's drawing of the proposed accessible ramp that we were promised in 2018 would be added to the front of city hall. So that was an absolute huge, um, huge score. I remember leaving city hall that day and walking back to the office and feeling as if I was six feet taller than I had been. I was just that pleased with myself. Wow, did I have a lot to learn. I will also quickly add that Misty and I had spoke about um, different styles of advocacy. And I was very much a supporter of suit and tie advocacy. We would sit down like civil adults and we would discuss things at the table and we would have organized meeting and there would be no shouting. Um, I had explained to Misty that my father had been a police officer and it was ingrained in me that if a police officer says, you know, you need to step back or step aside, that you needed to comply. Um, so this, this is kind of critical to later in the story. But anyway, yes, we're told we're going to have this amazing ramp. The city had spent in excess of $150,000 on blueprint prints and drawings. And, um, you know, they had it all set, ready to go. We were told that we would have that new ramp before the first snow fell. Um, needless to say, I was foolish enough to believe them. And I failed to ask in what year was this snow going to fall? I should have been a little more specific. But what we very, very quickly learned was that the city would continue to just kind of kick this can down the road. Fall of 2018 comes around. There's no more talk of access. There's new priorities. There's this, there's that. There's an incredible amount of excuses. Um, in September of 2019, we 
happened to um, be at the Mid-Atlantic ADA Conference, and we ran into um, a gentleman there with the Department of Justice. And so Misty had mentioned to this gentleman, and that's kind of where the ball started rolling with the Department of Justice investigation. And then in 2019, November of 2019, we, Roads to Freedom and our, the individual plaintiffs and ADAPT, we retained counsel, and it was at a city council meeting in November of 2019 that we gave letters to the members of city council and the administration that very, very clearly outlined our expectation. And that if the city was not compliant, if they weren't accountable, then we would pursue them with a lawsuit. And, you know, it wasn't very um, difficult. We didn't think we as advocates and persons with disabilities um, to make the city understand that a ramp would give access to everyone. And this great graphic on the slide, it's um, a group of kids and they're waiting at the bottom of some snow covered steps. It looks like it may be in a school. And next to the steps, there is an accessible ramp and the children are waiting at the bottom of the steps and the, the custodian is telling the kids, hey, I'll clear the ramp after I get these steps cleared. And one of the children is explaining to the custodian you could just clear the ramp and then everybody could come in all at once. Perfect. This is Misty again. Um, the image on the slide here is of our dear friend Spitfire and some other North Central PA ADAPT um, members in the front of the Community Arts Center during the um, Lycoming County inauguration. This particular protest um, was... North Central PA ADAPT's first um, protest regarding City Hall access. And the um, significance of this was the inauguration of our now mayor, who sat on City Council for the two years prior, two of the three years that we worked um, on improving the accessibility at City Hall and elsewhere in Williamsport. So um, we sat through the inauguration and when the mayor stood up to take his oath, the North Central PA ADAB members started chanting, access is a civil right, city hall for all. Um, and the inauguration was abruptly ended. Um, and myself, actually myself, only uh, was taken out in handcuffs. Uh, they didn't arrest any of the other members, certainly none in, in wheelchairs and took me over to the city hall mm -hmm. through the only accessible entrance. Um, and I use that term loosely uh, without all my friends. So once they realized my friends weren't leaving until I came back, after Karen said they were ordering pizza, <laughs> they returned me. And let's see. And then we can go to slide 23. And here's the image of the mayor standing up being sworn in. Um, and this was about the time North Central PA ADAPT started chanting. And I think it's over to you, Karen. Yes. Um, and as we were talking, um, like Misty had said, you know, we realized that the suit and tie advocacy that I had very firmly believed was going to be effective. You know, we've already got two years in the game here and we're still not seeing any action from the city. Um, we had been told on July 2nd of 2019 that the city did have an accessible location in mind and that they would be willing to relocate meetings to the Trade and Transit 2 Center. So we, again, we saw a little bit of optimism. Okay, you know, while the city figures out what their plan is going to be and while they're working to create a 504 plan for the city of Williamsport, um, we would be able to meet at Trade and Transit 2. It was a building that was um, built post 2010, very accessible, wonderful lighting, accessible parking. Um, it would be much safer. And again, it would give folks access. So keep that in mind. In July of 2019, the city has identified a location and uh, you know that's where we're going to be moving. And then I think Jay's gonna talk a little bit about why they, they could not commit to that. Sure. So as Karen was saying, you know, they indicated, the city did, that they had resources to complete the work, but did not want to commit. Um, a couple of reasons why they were not sure 
if they were going to stay or if they were going to go or, or leave City Hall due to the looming cost to fix uh, the leaky roof, the HVAC system, and a host of other maintenance projects that they said needed to be done. Um, they had the resources, but if they would spend the money, it would eliminate the nest day they had for a rainy day fund saved up. Um, again, not, not wanting to make the building accessible, even though they had the funds and the availability to do so. Um, they wanted to assure that they had funds available in case something came up and needed to be addressed. So we did mention that from the start of our meetings with the administration in 2017, we asked the city to move the public meetings and service, services to an accessible location. Um, this would meet the need of the disability community and the city decided, they would, uh, while the city decided if they were going to stay at the current location or re relocate services to a modern building. So again, this all was revolving around just moving the meetings to an accessible place so people with disabilities wanted to attend the, the meetings safely could do so. And yet they still fought us tooth and nail every step of the way. Next slide. Actually, JB. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can we go back to that slide, Jay? I think it, it this slide 24. Um, so in the image on the slide or the images on the slide. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So on this slide, um, there's two. It was, it's, I guess it's 22. It's the last right one you were on. Yep. Right there. I'm sorry. Uh, so on these, there's two images on the, on the slide. Uh, to the left, there's a young lady holding a sign and the sign says, move public meetings to an accessible location for all the public. And on the right hand side is an image actually, it's myself. Uh, Misty is sitting to the right of me on the floor and Jerry Webb is to the left of me. And the sign state public meetings should be accessible to all. I just kind of goes that we actually would attend the meetings and you know, state our case you know, and, 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 vo and voice our displeasure with the administration for their lack of movement on the promises and the accessibility they state they state they stated continuously they are working on and had a goal for. So before we switch to the next slide, I just wanted to say, so this was our second North Central PA DAP's second um, protest. Uh, the first being at the inauguration with the mayor and then here at the first city council meeting once he's been sworn in. Um, and, and shortly after the protest started, I think Karen's gonna expand on this. Uh, they ran from us, is that right, Karen? Yes, that is correct. Um, like, like Misty had said, you know, we had really hoped that the protest at the county inauguration in the beginning of January would have been effective, as we know it wasn't. So we had our second protest. And yes, it was, it was a, almost comical, I think, to see the reaction. Um, what had happened was, you know, we, we were chanting that, you know, business as usual would not happen. Um, and the uh, city members of the council and members of the administration decided that they would go relate, relocate to a different room in city hall. Um, and we followed them down the hall. And again, folks, this is after two plus years of, you know, being told a lot of untruths of, of directly being lied to. So it was at that protest then um, where the city continued in true fashion to be discriminatory. At this protest, um, Misty and myself, we were both arrested. Um, next slide, please, if we could, for slide 25, I believe it is. Yes, we were both arrested at this protest. And again, what I find incredibly interesting is that um, Misty and I were the only two that were charged. Um, there were other individuals there, such as Jay, persons that were using mobility devices, people that had disabilities, and none of those individuals were charged. So even in their arrest, the city of Williamsport um, chooses, chose to discriminate against those of us who just haven't been on this planet long enough, haven't aged enough yet to acquire a disability. So we were taken, as Misty had mentioned earlier, to the inaccessible city hall, and we were handcuffed and we were detained there for, I don't know, Misty, two, maybe three hours. Um, one of the things that we learned very quickly is that if the group that we were with 
demanded to, to stay with us, um, it tended to expedite things. The city was very quick. They did not want this lobby full of persons with disabilities hanging out waiting for Misty and I. So they kind of moved us along and we were told, OK, you know, you'll get your notice and you will appear in court. So that is um, January of 2020. So next slide, please. And we were very, very, oh, I'm don't, sorry, Jay. Say, we were very excited. I was going to say, Karen, don't forget to say the city hall at that point, we were locked out and we were locked in <laughs> and we were locked up. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Yes, that's an excellent point, Jay. At that point, yes, we had been locked out. We had been locked in and now we have officially been locked up. So it was absolutely fantastic, the coincidence of the date, that on January 28th, which is Ed Roberts Day, the city of Williamsport shared a press release and had some information to share about the public meetings. And Jay's going to share that press release with you. So as you see on the slide, there's a press release from the city of Williamsport from the city council members, and the press release reads, as many of you know, there is an active inquiry by the United States Department of Justice into Americans with Disabilities Act compliance of the city's programs and services. The city of Williamsport is fully cooperating with the Department of Justice to assist in that inquiry. Because that inquiry and remedial efforts will take time, in the interim, effective Thursday, February 20th, 2020, with the regular scheduled city council meeting, the city of Williamsport will hold all public meetings at Trade and Transit 2 Center, 144 West 3rd Street in Williamsport. This move is to show a good faith by city council as we are committed to working alongside all stakeholders in the city of Williamsport to provide a safe and accessible venue for all public meetings. We hope this move can be a fresh start and will permit all of our citizens to attend city council or committee meetings while the legal process runs its course. Our goal is to provide an acceptable temporary solution while we all work together toward a permanent one. While we recognize the importance of solving this issue in a timely manner, this is not the only issue facing the city of Williamsport. To continue working on issues facing our city, we need to hold public meetings. Our hope is that this is a temporary move. Well, our hope is that this temporary move allows us to continue to conduct steady business efficiently with and without delay, while demonstrating our commitment to represent all citizens of the city of Williamsport. We are here to advocate for all citizens because it will take all of us to move the city of Williamsport forward. Cough, cough. <laughs> <laughs> so next slide, please. Slide 27 shows. Um, now this is, as Jay had spoke about, you know, it was our anniversary. It was February 2nd of 2020. We just recently, we call it our accessiversary instead of our anniversary, but we just had our two-year accessiversary of accessible meetings. And then what happens? So we move into trade and transit too. We have one, maybe two meetings, and then the COVID pandemic begins. Um, so of course, meetings now are going to be made virtual. There's going to be no in-person meetings, nothing of that nature will occur, which brings to the light of the city's attention that there are other concerns for access now. I think some of the members of the city were kind of pleased to see that hosting virtual meetings. Okay, everybody can access that. But they had never given thought to what about captioning, um, that not everybody can audibly hear what is going on. So we again went back to the city and we said, hey, um, you know, we, we appreciate the move and now you're doing things with, um, you know, this great technology and we're meeting virtually, but you still need to make your meetings accessible. And so the city... Uh, <laughs> once again said no, it was pretty much all that they could do to move these meetings. I, I want to add that at this very first meeting on the 20th or on February 2nd of 2020, when the city started the meeting, as they always do, they do a prayer, um, that council member Bonnie Katz apologized to everybody at the meeting for the inconvenience of having to relocate, that, that she was sorry for folks that they had to leave City Hall and they had to go to this new location. So I think that in itself kind of shows the amount of buy-in that, that we had seen from members of the city, from the administration and from city council at this time. So again, like I said, we have no access. We can get to these Zoom meetings, but we need captioning. We need some other technology and it wasn't happening. So that was it. Um, 
We contacted a couple attorneys. We reached out to David Furliger of, in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, and to Mr. Thomas Earl in Philadelphia. And we said to them, you know, we would like you to represent us for this case. And lo and behold, on July 15th, the anniversary month for 30 years of the signing of the ADA, um, the city was notified and the case was filed. Next slide. Before you go to the next slide. So um, in preemptive celebration for the 30th anniversary, we were delighted to file um, the long overdue, in my opinion, case. Um, and, and one reason that led us to sort of do that at that time, um, not just around the anniversary, but as Karen said, with even even more barriers to being heard and to interacting with city council and mayor and the public, I'm not being able to interact or be a part of the, the public meetings and the city council meetings really caused more concern, which sort of prefaced our um, or led us into moving forward with the lawsuit. Thank you, Misty. Next slide, please, slide 28. And on, this, on the screen, the image is the signature page from the consent decree. And you'll see where it was signed by our legal team and the city's legal team and um, federal judge, Matthew Braun. And next slide, please, 29. All right, so this slide, uh, this, this gives a little brief synopsis of what the consent decree states. I can read it for everyone. Um, the consent decree provided assurance that the elevator and ramp would be accessible, that there, there would, uh, would require an accessibility consultant, the creation and implementation of a work plan, establishes the joint committee. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute requires disability awareness training for all employees, establishes a complaint and resolution process that's accessible through their website as well. Uh, the city of Waynesport was responsible for legal fees. There was a development of reporting and monitoring tools. And within and this, this is very important. Within the consent decree, there was a deadline of March 10th, 2022 for a list of things that needed to be completed. And the city agreed to this. The city agreed to all of these things. They signed off on everything as part of the agreement and the, cons the consent decree. Um, going back to the joint committee, uh, the joint committee was established. My, it's myself and Misty. I am the joint chair. Uh, Misty, is, Misty is, represents us. Uh, the city has uh, the mayor, um, a gentleman by the name of John Sanders, and it was President uh, or Council President Randy Allison, but now um, Adam Yoder is the new president of the council. So there's a transition of going on. But uh, the, the, the joint committee is, would have a bi weekly meeting. We'd have agendas to talk about the work plan, different accessibility issues, just, just, just to get a start on the agreement that the city agreed to and start making things finally make progress and move things forward. Um, our, ce our celebration was not was not long lived. Uh, the, I mean, the consent decree is that uh, with I'd say about what, less than four months after the consent decree was accepted, it was pretty clear that uh, the city was not following through. They were doing things uh, without our input, without following um, an ADA coordinator to make things sure they're accessible, following the law. They were jumping the gun on a lot of things. Uh, they were more worried about dates that they had agreed to than actually involving us and in having communication. So about four months into this, uh, we started discussing file contempt charges for failure to comply with the consent decree. Um, the, the, the main, one of the main hurdles was there was no ADA coordinator and they had yet to provide a work plan to the joint committee. Um, they had nobody in-house or anybody outside contracted to be the consent decree de co uh, coordinator. Uh, the city had contracted with a company that would ramp fabricated that would be installed, installed in front of City Hall. This was the only action that they had taken to comply with the consent decree to this date. Again, they, they, we, we've been speaking with them bi-weekly since March. And at our last meeting, at the conclusion of our last meeting, I have said to Karen Misty, 
it could be February of 2021 and not 2022 because nothing has changed. The city is, you know, has their has their heels in the sand and they're just fighting us tooth and nail every step of the way, even for the most or for the easiest uh, items to talk about the work plan and other items what that are involved with the consent decree. I'm not sure if Misty wants to talk about anything else with that, but the city, the city, the city just, is, just for some reason does not want to follow the law and they're learning the hard way of what happens when you don't follow the law. Yeah, and I'll just, before you go to the next slide, Jay, um, I think to me it's almost like um, deliberate indifference and so this consent degree really, so they had indiberate, deliberate indifference, I feel like throughout the three years that we tried to work, as Karen said, in the suit and tie um, advocacy. And, you know, it wasn't until sort of North Central PA ADAPT came in and, and tried to hold them accountable or until attorneys came in and started holding accountability um, to timelines and action steps that we sort of see this, this deliberate indifference kind of just stall. And so, um, like Jay said, it led us into, you know, almost a year after we filed the contempt, the lawsuit, um, and then March, they, we had the consent degree. And now in July of 2021, we're facing, um, filing contempt charges. And I'll let Jay go into that. Next slide, slide 30, I believe. So as you see on July 6th, 2021, um, the motion of contempt was filed against the city of Williamsport for city hall re renovations. On that slide, you'll see a picture of some local media coverage of it. So again, we were asking as the consent decree outlined, the hiring of a certified ADA coordinator. The city was trying to, to say they, they, they had somebody on staff that could Google. I believe they said Google, right, Karen? That yes. Mr. Girardi was going to Google ADA compliance for different for different parts of the building when it comes to the bathrooms and entrances and things like that, which again, the consent decree clearly outlined. Uh, there was uh, a need for a consent decree coordinator and- uh, And an accessibility uh, consultant. An accessibility consultant. Thank you, Misty. Yep. Um, oh, go ahead, you wanna take over? I was just gonna say later um, after the contempt charges, uh, we, we did end up, um, the city consulted with Mark Derry and Associates. Many of you may be familiar with Mark Derry. Um, long history in the IL movement, great ADA um, and accessibility consultant. And then Janetta uh, Green, who is the CEO for a Center for Independent Living of Central PA in Harrisburg in, in Pennsylvania. So we were able to add a few more experienced team members to the group. Um, adding on top of that, uh, we, we continued to work with the city about a work plan. The work plan was, uh, it's made to identify the barriers uh, that, are, that are facing the, the, the city buildings and who would be responsible to resolve the barrier and a, a data completion. Um, we're, we're, still, we're still fighting on that. We'll still talk that more. We're still fighting that. Uh, the city was also ordered to provide disability awareness training for approximately 250 uh, employees. Uh, we were in discussions with the mayor about that for weeks and then months. Finally, uh, we provided the Center uh, Roads to Freedom, Center for Ability, provided uh, seven, uh, 14 total, but there was two different trainings, uh, Project ABLE, and then there was an on-hands lecture for ADA training that we provided to the city. Uh, even after offering seven different uh, dates for both sets of training, to this date, not all city employees are still trained. At our last meeting, the mayor is still talking about getting a curriculum and things put in charge or put put into put a, a course put together for those. There was also talk about how the building is a historical building, so the slate roof could not be replaced with composite or less excessive product and it must retain its historical architecture, resulting in a very high cost. According to the city, uh, the design of the building uh, incorporated rain gutters that were actually inside the city wall, city hall walls. Uh, because of this, there, was a, there were leaks, so the city was able to determine the extent of the damage or where the leaks were actually located. 
Uh, it was reported that there was high level of mold in the building and that an IAQ test resulted in the need, in the need to condemn the structure. Uh, this resulted in the city's need to relocate services housed in City Hall throughout the buildings uh, in the city. Uh, this also meant that the ADA coordinator was now going to need to complete access, sur access surveys for those additional locations, not just City Hall. The city uh, indicated that due to the, the condemning of City Hall that they would not do any upgrades or work inside the building until they figure out what their future steps were going to be. Um, they did play. They were. They did continue to state that they were going to place the ramp out in front, but until they determined if it was financially feasible to repair the city hall, all interior work was stopping at that current date. Yeah, Jay. Um, this is Karen. I would just like to add that it just seems so coincidental that the contempt charges were filed on July sixth, and then it was two weeks after that that the city condemned their own building. And that's just what I wanna stress. There, there was an OSHA was not involved. There was no insurance company. Um, it was the codes officer who condemned their own building. Just felt that that was kind of good information to chew on out there. And the pro of the, in the, the positive uh, side of that coin is our consent decree really focused on the city hall building itself. Luckily, we had the clause in there. I mean, there was the training, the need for an ADA coordinator and accessibility consultant and, you know, accessibility features amongst um, many other um, concerns that we had. But the main focus was City Hall. And so when they condemned City Hall and moved the function and administration to other locations, we got five buildings for the price of one. <laughs> Yes, I don't think, I think it was kind of surprising when the city realized, oh my goodness, so Mr. Derry is not just going to inspect City Hall, he has to go to these four other locations. Um, fortunately, the other locations did not have near the list of deficiencies. I mean, there were still barriers identified, um, but not near, near as um, deplorable as City Hall. Um, next slide, please, slide 31. Okay, now, if you're, if you're still munching on your popcorn and you think we're getting near the end of this, folks, not even close. You might want to pop a second bag. So the image on slide 31 is of the front of City Hall. This photo was taken in December of 2021, and it shows the groundbreaking. There's a large excavator digging a huge ditch in the front of the building, and this is where they would be placing the precast ramp. Now, like Jay mentioned, um, that is the only work that the city has done at this time. The deficiency report that they received from Mark Derry, um, I believe it was a 31-page report, and it very, very well detailed exactly, you know, what the deficiency was. And it also um, had a priority, you know, in what order you would want to prioritize these repairs to correct these issues. Um, and like Jay said, you know, the city didn't prioritize anything. So next slide, please, slide 32. And now, oh, Karen, please. Do you, sorry <laughs> to interrupt. I didn't know Go if ahead. you wanted to point out the um, the snow covered ramp in that last image. Oh, I don't think we've gotten to that one yet, but I will, Misty, definitely. Um, so yes, now we have the the ramp. They had a it was a precast ramp. They found a company that could make the ramp. And when we talked about the consent decree and the need for the ADA coordinator. We, we pretty much begged with the city, please don't start making corrections, repairs until you have a coordinator that you can work with. And again, like we said earlier, now nah, we'll just Google it. So they found this company and they made this precast ramp and the ramp was delivered and the ramp was installed. The ramp was delivered in three pieces. And I will say that the middle portion, um, just barely, just barely was the slope on it. Um, compliant with ADA. So we now have this ramp in front of City Hall. And this photo is, um, is prior to the railings and stuff. And if we could go to the next slide, please, slide 33. We now have a ramp to nowhere. We call this ramp the ramp to nowhere because, um, first of all, we, if you access the ramp and you get to the top of the ramp, you, you can't access the building. It's still 20 28 inch doors and you know the big divider in the middle. Um, the image that is slide 33 is a photo of Mark Derry 
standing leaning on the railing of the accessible ramp that's located at 245 West 4th Street in Williamsport. Um, there's a level there at Mark's feet on the ground. This is the level of involvement that we saw from the city. Um, the day that Mark went to survey the ramp to assure that it was compliant, the city had failed to have any snow shoveled from the ramp. And there was no one there from the city, not the city engineer, no one from administration, um, no one. But there you have it, like I said, the, the ramp to nowhere. So the PowerPoint kind of our videos and slides stop here, but I would like Jay and Misty, uh, member, members of the joint committee, if you two could discuss the meeting that was held last Wednesday with our legal team, with the city's attorneys and with our attorneys and kind of little summarize as to where we are now with the city of Williamsport, if you would please. Sure, I'll, I'll take it and Jay, you can add if there's anything I missed. Um, but I think, you know, so we filed the contempt order and the biggest issue that still remains is now there's five other buildings and there's this work plan and inside this work plan, it needs to, like Karen said, prioritize all of the upgrades that need done to, to bring all of the buildings to compliance. As such, um, you know, the work plan draft has been due to us for quite some time and it is yet to be finalized or put our feedback, incorporate our feedback or suggestions. So, you know, we've met with them recently and sort of rediscussed the expectations of a work plan and, and what it consists of. And so right now we're sort of waiting on um, on the contempt orders uh, from the judge and, you know, feedback from the city of Williamsport as to our final work plan order. I'll follow up on that a little bit. So going back to uh, the work plan, as we say, the work plan states all of these items need to be completed by March 10th, 2022. And we had drafted an email and sent it to the city on January 18th just outlining several issues with their, with the appendix A and appendix B, um, just stating how, you know, it's not feasible. We're, we're to the point now where you're less than two months away. How are you going to make all these accommodations? Uh, we were asking for them to reevaluate, to reevaluate with new dates, to reevaluate in uh, what order, what, what was the highest importance, you know, one, two, three, four, five, who would be performing the, um, operations to make it accessible, would it be done in-house or would they be doing it outside an outside contractor or putting things out for bid? Um, and just, I mean, we're talking about city hall where again, you know, due to my disability, I couldn't access the bathroom. So to make the bathrooms accessible, they're talking about having to move load bearing walls. So you're at the point now where you're less than two months away from a March 10th date. And there's been no discussion of any of these items, let alone going in there and trying to move plumbing walls and other accessories that need to make the building accessible. Uh, we sent that email on January 18th, um, went to the next joint committee meeting uh, to the point where one of the members asked of where the email was during the meeting because he had not even opened the email at that time. So again, this, even though we continue to outline and give the city ample opportunities to adjust, make changes and have an open dialogue, we have these joint committee meetings. I feel like, and I, I believe Karen and Misty feel the same way that we start the meetings. They try to get through the meetings as quick as possible without saying as much as, or with saying as little as they can. And they try to run the clock out just to get to the next meeting so we can be over. And uh, there's, just, there's just been no progress. So speaking with the attorneys and having a discussion with their, their attorney, hopefully makes some headway and there's some action in the near future. And I will say, going back to that picture of the ramp right there, uh, when they actually officially opened the ramp that we could come over and take a look at it, uh, myself, Mark was there, Karen was there. Uh, that day, the ramp was actually shoveled. But what you can't see that a different day, the bottom of the ramp, they had shoveled the sidewalk in front of City Hall. So there was a nice about eight inch high crust of ice that I could not even access the ramp because my chair could not get through it. So the disdain and I don't believe that was done unintentionally. I, I fully believe the city did not shovel that so we cannot use the ramp or somebody in a wheelchair cannot use the ramp. 
And uh, again, it's just it's another item that some people may say, oh, you're just nitpicking or you're looking for things to complain about. But for someone that uses a wheelchair and would need to use that ramp for access, there's no way my chair was going to go. I wasn't going to tear the bottom of my chair off to go through an ice mound to access the ramp that, that morning. Jay, somehow I think that nobody would say that any of you are looking for things to complain about. They, I would, I they're, would being presented. <laughs> they're being presented to you very clearly. This is our story, Ann, and we're sticking to it. Yeah, <laughs> you can't yeah. make this stuff up. I mean, it's just... Well, um, I have a question for you guys. I have an, a couple of questions and I encourage the audience. We have some time um, and this is a great opportunity with Jay and Misty and Karen here to ask, uh, ask some questions. And one of my questions, I know that there was representation from the city of Williamsport at our uh, annual ADA conference. And um, I, so I know they're clearly paying a little attention to this. Um, although, you know, Misty, I think that phrase deliberate indifference is definitely one to use uh, in the future. But um, did anything come of that? Did you guys hear anything from an, quote, ADA coordinator from the city of Williamsport or any information that they may have uh, received or contact they made for technical assistance? So this is Misty. I'll answer that. And um, the they did participate in um, the Mid Atlantic ADA resources and conference, and I think they're going through um, the training, the certification for the ADA ADA coordinator. At our request, we we sort of outlined that within the consent decree. And so once we agreed on that, that sort of started it. And you're right. Um, after we filed the contempt orders, because of the ADA, their lack of um, movement with hiring an ADA coordinator and an accessibility consultant, that's when we filed the contempt order to sort of say, you know, clock's ticking. We have a deadline and we need to meet it. They were already doing the ramp and hadn't had the consultant look at it. Mm. And so that was our concern. We really wanted to have. And so that's that's now why they are working towards um, doing the ADA or ADA coordinator certification. And we also added in like experience time. So they don't just have to have the knowledge. They have to have a certain uh, level of experience as well. Now, you've talked about what Mark Derry found in his report. And what about Janetta Green? Um from the Central uh, Center for Independent Living. Yeah, so that was interesting. A lot, so, you know, I think it's for some people, it's easier, right, to say there's stairs in the front of the building and we're in a wheelchair and can't get, get in. But for other people to understand sort of programmatical mm -hmm. barriers to access, um, I think, you know, we had to sort of break it down to captioning to allowing time at the beginning of your public meeting for people to get on the agenda instead of this archaic approach that we had to send in a request, you know, a week in advance to be on an agenda that then changed that same night. <laughs> so, I mean, we had, we had really through COVID and through um, working with the ADA coordinator, seen a lot of the barriers to programmatic access that were happening right down to the website and right. training. So that's all incorporated. Yeah, I, I think I, I think um, that's a really good point that you're underlining and highlighting here because you're talking about, you know, basic access and ramps here. We haven't even gotten to how do you uh, apply the concepts of pro program access, reasonable modifications to policies, practices and procedures, effective communication, which they clearly don't have any idea what, what that's about. So the nuances of the rest of the requirements of Title II, they they can't even get the most basic stuff. I can't imagine how frustrating that is for you. And I think that's the key because this work plan is sort of where we're at now and where we've been for so long, but that is for all the buildings and for the program access and the other training um, requirements that are in there. So, I mean, that's why this work plan is so important. And like Jay said, now we've got two months left and we still don't have a finalized work plan that includes all of the building five buildings and the programmatical access. So. so what happens when March 
10th comes if they don't have a plan in place? You know, I think since we're in the midst of this legal uh, proceedings, we sort of have to just wait and see how what the judge says. Um, we're just going to have to keep holding them accountable on, you know, to the documents and, and to the process we've agreed on and sort of, you know, maybe the judge will be able to answer that, or maybe we'll need to have like a special master, someone to sort of make us follow the protocols and agreements we have and the law. Right. Now, has the local press or uh, media, how have they, uh, have they been supportive of your efforts or what has that been like? Yeah, I can, if one of my other colleagues want to take this one or I can, if you'd like. Go ahead, Misty. I mean, I think so. We've seen both sides, right? Mm -hmm. We we know there's a there's a local reporter who is at every city council meeting, and the mayor, you know, calls on them to come in and get the story when they want the story to be out. And then we've got some other sort of, you know. Um, like northcentralpa.com, which, you know, is in a paper, it's sort of social media, um, independent imp uh, reporters and some, you know, larger reporters out in Harrisburg area. They've contacted us and sort of had a pretty realistic portrayal of the battle that we've went through. Um, some of the local reporters, like the one I mentioned earlier, that's sort of at every city council meeting. I mean, you can see, you can see there's sort of a push and a pull of uh, the dynamics from one side to the other. Um, but I think, you know, once we sort of put out our own press releases and started using social media and our marketing, you know, tools, then we were able to give the public the the facts and sort of help people understand that, you know, citizens in Williamsport with disabilities pay taxes too. And this, this isn't costing more because of us. This is costing more because the city's not in compliance with the law and doing what they should be. So, I mean, there was a time where the the city and the media sort of had that dynamic and almost made it, you know, the all oh, look at the cost that we're going to incur. But, you know, unfortunately, like you've seen over this three and a half year span, we've worked to try to prevent that. It's their um, deliberate indifference, if you will, that's costing the extra amount. Well, and I think one of the things that all of us work toward, all of us, whether we're advocates, whether we're educators, no matter what, the ADA is about civil rights and inclusion of people with disabilities. This is inclusion of everyone. And the signs were so compelling. Um, you know, it, they're missing the whole, whole point of this. And, and it's turned into us versus them. And, and they're not, they've lost sight of the point and the intent of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that's the saddest thing here. It really is. And uh, it, it's just, especially 30, 30 years later, it, right. that's, that's what's so astounding here. Um, I wanted to point out in, in the chat, somebody had mentioned about we should, you know, they should find them every day they're past the deadline. In fact, that is part of the contempt order. We do have fines that have, you know, sort of grown at this point because of their lack of compliance. And so that's that's what we talked about earlier with holding them accountable. It seems that's the only way you can do it. And the follow up quickly, when you talk about money and what, what the city's doing and what they're not doing. Uh, part, of, part of our joint committee was we asked, we continually asked them to live stream our meetings, our biweekly meetings, and to have a captioning, a, a captioning uh, app or you know, program so it, it would be captioned. Uh, for 11 months, they fought us. And Misty, we kept to the point where Misty went and found them a program called Otter AI, and it cost $99 for the year. And when we kept putting the mayor's feet to the fire, he could not commit to spending $99 for one year for this service because of ongoing issues with investigations and other things that are going on with the city that do not 
do not have anything to do with us, but there's also some financial investigations going on that he could not, he could not commit at that time to $99 to caption our meetings. Now, thankfully about, I'd say three weeks ago or four weeks ago, they finally started live streaming and record, saying they're recording the meetings. Our, our February 7th meeting, it's, we're still trying to find it. But just to show you that, again, $99, and they're going to fight us with that amount of money just to make a meeting accessible for closed captioning. Yeah, I would like to add that this is a city that, you know, provides bottled waters to their bottled water to their employees at council meetings. And they now have a Corig there in the room, you know, that they were able to prioritize beverages for the employees over allowing access to, you know, like Jay said, to have to have captioning for the meetings. Um, it's it's just, you know, when you talk about access, like so many people think, you know, nobody thinks about the programs and the services. It's just, you've got a ramp. What more do you need? You know, that doorway's wide enough. There's a button on it. You people should be happy, quote unquote. Um, no. Well, um, so how, what was, I can't even imagine what the county, how the county uh, employees um, received the disability awareness training. Um, what do you, did, first of all, did you guys provide it or did somebody else provide it? And, um, I think you said, Jay, you, you did yeah. the training. No, we, prov How we, was we, that? Prov we provided it. We gave, like I said, we had the last week in September, we offered five trainings uh, the last week in October, we offered five trainings and then we had several makeups and, Myself and Karen was there. Karen, uh, we uh, we uh, did a. You want to talk about this, Karen, or you want me to discuss it? Well, no, that's fine. Yeah, um, and when you talk about the trainings, like Jay said, yes, that was one of the things that we had offered to the city. Um, so we use the we use modules from the training leadership. Hey. Network. Yes, <laughs> we use no. It was um, it was absolutely wonderful to talk about you know how to make an accommodation. You know what is an accommodation. And like Jay had mentioned earlier, the city had approximately 250 employees, all were to participate. And it was very, very clear that there had been no buy-in from the top. Um, I'll, I will use this example. Uh, we had capped the sessions at 40 people per session. And at some of the sessions, you know, we had made it very clear when we had spoke with the mayor and we set up the training, you know, your fire department, your people that are working 24 seven, your emergency responders, you know, please don't send them in while they're on duty. You know, they need to be able to participate and focus. So what happened was um, some people basically refused to attend downright, just refused, said, I'm not doing that. Um, it wasn't my idea not to build a ramp. You know, people didn't understand that city council could make this decision that would impact all of them. But I was absolutely floored. Um, I've been a member of the Training Leadership Network now. This is my fourth year. And I had never presented to a group of people that were court ordered to participate in training. I had heard you, Ann, and Karen, yeah. and a few others talk about, <laughs> yes, it's not the same fun crowd. Um, <laughs> I will say that I had one police officer who was seated right in the front row. And, and how about it, Jay? He was totally checked out. His head was back. He had his cell phone in his lap. And I'm looking at his cell phone and it's not his work cell phone. So after about 10 minutes of this man, doo -doo -doo, and his keys aren't muted, you know, and he's clicking and snapping and popping away. I asked him, I said, is, is there an emergency or something? He's a police officer and he's in uniform. I said, if there's an emergency officer, please, by all means, you know, go ahead and leave, go take care of business. And he looked at me and said, no, there's no emergency. I'm taking care of personal business. Um, that talk that I had had a while back from my supervisors about civility and things like that, I employed that very quickly in my brain. Um, and I asked him, I said, well, oh, okay, well, that's great. You're taking care of personal business. So when you're done, I said, how about you just let us know and we'll continue with the presentation. Um, and he actually, he had wrote on the feedback form for the presentation that the trainers were very rude about people doing personal business during the training. He actually wow. acknowledged that he was doing personal business with it, which if that doesn't sum up how serious 
they felt this training was. Um, Jay, I think, wasn't there someone in the training that made the comment that if they were real trainers, they would participate, but because it was people from the Center for Independent Living and Adapt and perhaps people with disabilities that, you know, who's better qualified at knowing about a disability than, than Jay would be, for example. Um, sure. There were some folks that were very receptive of it. And, and I will say that it was mostly the folks that work in transportation, the folks that are out there dealing, working with the public, that see the public, that identify the public. Um, there were many of the bus drivers who came to us when they found out about some of our programs and our reuse program where we recycle durable medical equipment. Mm -hmm. um, there were probably five or six of them that were talking about a particular woman who uses the mass transit and that we may be able to help her. And, you know, we encourage them to have her get in touch with us. It was to the point and that people so didn't want to participate in it that they falsified and forged other staff signatures on the attendance. Um, this, this is straight up. There was one of the gentlemen who I've been in meetings with for four years. I'm very aware of who Adam is. If Adam were in the room, I would know it. And at the end of the training, when I was reviewing participants, um, I spoke to Jay and a couple others that were there. And, you know, geez, guys, did I really space out today or did I miss it? No, he, he wasn't there. But a coworker just figured they would sign him on because it was easier to lie and falsify records than to participate in disability awareness training for a lot of those folks. So... That, yeah. Um, some were well received, others, yes, very, very long way to go. Thank you, Ian. To follow and to follow up with Karen there real fast, you know, a lot, a lot of the just disrespect from some of the employees, it was, well, you know, what city council are not employees. So they did not have to actually take care, take part of the training. So a lot of it was, mm. I'm not the one that makes the votes, I'm not the one that does the budgets. Why are we the ones here? They should be the ones that are, 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 you know, taking part in this. And it was like, you know, today's my day off or I have things to do and, you know, diff different things like that. Just, just a lack of just, you know, empathy. Like the not, not even trying to understand, you know, and I, and again, I'm a logical I'm sitting there. I'm just trying to do my thing and give them their information. I can tell they don't want to be there. And I even said to them, I said, you know, a lot of times like, I know you don't want to be here. And I wish I wasn't doing this because if the city was accessible, we won't be doing this training. So just, you know, here's my story. Here's my information. And we'll move on. And even that it was, you know, turning, get, getting your back turned on, you know, looking around, having a conversation with somebody else, just, just, just being disrespectful. And it was just, you know, we're supposed to respect city employees, especially the police, but you know, when it, when it came time for their respect to us, it was, it was not given very, very easily. Yeah. And I will, oh, go I ahead. Will say, you know, the, the transportation, uh, River mm -hmm. Valley Transportation, the staff with that, you know, the staff who are on the ground working with us um, most often had a great time. They, you know, the responses from them were that they learned a lot and it was very beneficial. So there was, there was certainly a handful of people who, you know, shined. And I will reference the first, there was two sessions, the first session that uh, Jay and uh, Karen referenced when they said, Project Able, that's sort of a hands-on opportunity to try on a disability. And, you know, um, some of the refusals was, you know, like, we're not going to get in that wheelchair and try to go up that ramp. <laughs> yeah, because it was scary. Yeah. And so we had that dialogue about, you know, liability and that sort of thing. But yeah, so it, it's so interesting because we have quite a few conversations with people implementing, uh, whether it's, you know, any part of the law. And, and we talk a lot about how do you get buy-in from the top level and how important that is if, if it's going to happen. Because even if you have a consent decree and you've had a um, lawsuit filed against you, et cetera, and you have a consent decree, if you get the leadership on board, they set the tone for how everybody else is going to participate. And I've done trainings for, for people who have, who are under court order and get can, they, they, mandatory trainings. However, it's a totally different focus if their leadership has bought in. So the, the obviously the, the city people were mimicking what they saw from their leadership, which, uh, which is, is, 
what what you guys have been uh, dealing with for for so long. So I, I have to ask, um, what was the since you both have been arrested? Do you both have a record now? What what is the outcome for? And, and Jay, it sounds like you 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 know escaped being arrested because they probably didn't want to be seen arresting somebody in a wheelchair, but. Uh, they don't have an accessible cruiser. They couldn't take Jay oh, to there City you Hall. <laughs> they did try to drive my chair that night to make to. So real quick, I was trying to block. They were they were trying to remove Misty through a hallway area, and I was kind of in the way. And the one officer kept telling me to move, and I was looking at Misty, and she was like shaking her head. So I was sitting there, and I said, like, "I'm not moving." To the point where he actually reached down and grabbed my controller and backed me out of the chair, and like I ran, I hit, I hit somebody behind me. But oh, jeez. Yeah, but they, they, they didn't arrest me. No. Yeah, Jay, Jay got out unscathed. I will, I will let Karen, I, I do have an arrest record, but not from this. Um, Karen, both, both my, well, so Karen and I did go and we tried to um, plead our case ourselves. We went without an attorney and thought, that's fine. It's easy. There's a group of people on video doing the same thing. And they took the two not disabled yet people. Um, So, you know, for walking and they're pulling us and pushing the wheelchairs and it's very easy to see. So we went and we lost that court hearing, believe it or not. Um, Healed and yeah. So we were fined with disorderly conduct and we appealed it. Uh, we found an, a local attorney um, from through the ACLU who took our case. We went to visit him because his location was not accessible. That ended up helping us. Okay. Um, once we pointed out that we could have him over to our accessible location, he was not willing to charge us. Um <laughs> So that worked out. They did drop first. They brought us in and and said that they would be willing to drop the cases if we signed saying that we would not bring discrimination cases um, again or this one, you know, again. And we said we can't do that. We're in the middle of a, uh, you know, the consent decree and, and working with them on discriminating for with access. And so we held out until after the contempt order was filed before we filed for the fines, we, we were, the mayor contacted me and let me know that they had dropped the, the, um, our, um, record. So. Yeah. They, they had dropped our charges. Yes. After, right. After we had the ACL, ACLU attorney. Um, I just want to comment on one thing, Ann, and kind of going back to what you said about, you know, if there's not buy-in at the top, I will use an expression that my friend Jay Harder has taught me, that the fish rots from the head. And that is truly, <laughs> truly, um, you know, eloquence is not my thing. I, I'm just so frustrated, you know. We have the ADA. We are 32 years past ADA. When you have the order signed by a federal judge, how much more advocacy should you have to do? You know, so for, for those, for, for folks who think, you know, hey, this is, you know, no big deal. We, I did four years ago. I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be roller skating on that new ramp within a year. Huh. Oh, my. Um, so, yes, we, we're really appreciative, too, and to you and the ADA Center for getting this story out there, for letting us share this. Well, I mean, I think it's such a good example of, you know, the efforts to collaborate and it it shows what can, I mean, really worst case scenario, what can happen because um, nobody would argue that the whole point is lost here. They're just missing the whole point of this law and everything it's about. And so when that happens, then you know, we have to use the court system to, to that's, that's what the justice system is for. And uh, it's just, you know, 30 years later, you, you would hope, especially the other thing that is so surprising to me is there's so many resources out there for Title II entities, and not only on physical accessibility, but on 
program accessibility and the requirements of Title II and, you know, state and local governments who have been doing, you know, the best that they can and have been making buildings accessible and have a long-term plan in place and really been trying over time and collaborating with the people with disabilities in their community. I, you know, I just think along the way, what if they had sat down with you and said, okay, can you give us some advice on the best, most cost-effective way to do this? And, and, and the collaboration, the potential for collaboration is so great. And they could have saved time and enter all of your guys time and energy and money etc and and it's just um so astonishing now we still have a, a couple of more questions here because we're we've got about five more minutes um so <laughs> i love this one what would you suggest to advocates that are working on barrier removal, so if they were Title II entities, um, with little success after what you've been through? So Get this a is deal, Bondsman. <laughs> <laughs> no, so this is Misty. I mean, we saw movement once we took action. Um, and that's why we joined that's why we had organizational, two organizational plaintiffs. We worked together as a SIL to support and educate people, consumers, um, citizens that were giving us the experiences to say, here's, here's the tools, write email calls, let's go to the meetings, we'll walk alongside, you know, we'll roll alongside you, we'll do... We'll do this together. And when that just didn't work anymore, when we were, you know, we, like Karen said, when we got to the point where we realized there's just, we're not getting anywhere, having North, you know, having ADAPT come in and take action and bring the media and educate the mass, the public and, you know, put their foot down that, okay, no, we're going to be heard and we're not just going to be spoken down to or ignored and you know, that's when we started seeing movement. So I think it's, it's taking a, a multi-prong approach and looking at taking action in different levels. And it sounds like getting support and as power well. in numbers, power yeah. in numbers. Yes. Yeah. And so we have the, the, I think the last slide here um, that, that you wanted to uh, thank the individuals for their support of independent living. Yes, yeah, so Thomas Earl is the CEO for the Philadelphia Liberty Resources Center for Independent Living, and he's the co-litigator um, as well as uh, the co-attorney, as well as David Furliger, who some of you may know for his great work with Olmstead, sort of taking ADA to the next level in terms of community living and least restrictive environments. And so both of them have been, you know, very helpful in making sure that the civil rights aspects of what we're putting into the consent decrees and these orders are true to um, opening access for the entire community for all people with disabilities. And so for that, I love it <clears throat> and, and all their support. And, you know, they haven't gotten paid what they would be getting paid. I mean, they've been helping us do this and trying to, to accommodate. And then Shaylin Suzalis was one of the founding um, ADAPT organizers. And without her early leadership and work in this, you know, ADAPT might not have been able to come in and be as you know powerful as they have been through the whole situation. So, so thanks to those and my colleagues who are here today. Yeah, well, thank you on behalf of, of the audience and of everybody. And uh, uh, here's your contact information. Anybody feel free to reach out to Misty and Karen. Um, uh, and you've, you've got the, the email and Dion, D-I-O-N, at C-I-L-N-C-P dot org, and K Cook, K-O-C-H, at C-I-L-N-C-P dot org, um, and voice numbers 570-327-9070, toll-free, uh, 800-985-7492 and video phone 570-279-4229 and CapTel 570-601-1429 and email, well, you've got the emails office at 
C-I-L-N-C-P.org. Um, and fax, do people still use fax machines? <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> Good. Uh, fax number is 570-327-8610. And the information is on the slides that were, were sent to you. But thank you guys so much. You did a fabulous job, Jay, Karen, and Misty. Uh, thank you for joining us. As I said, we're the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Our 800 number is 1-800-949-4232. We're here to answer all your questions about Title II and any part of the ADA. Our local number is 301-217-0124. And our email is adainfo at transcend.org. Our website is adainfo.org. But again, thank you guys so much. I'm so glad we have this on archive now and we can share your stories with other. The work you're doing is going to have such a great ripple effect. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Be safe.